Before I begin, be sure to like the video and leave a comment on what you think of it. Also, be sure to subscribe to my channel and ring the bell to keep up with further audiobook readings. Chapter 17 Perfection I was gonna put the totals, but I thought it might be fun for y'all to add it up with the kids. What you're looking at is arguably the greatest individual hot streak in the history of Hollywood. Note, my editor forced me, against my will, to add arguably. I was running my life like a fight camp. Darrell had become not only my trainer, but my mentor and my protector. Ali had been my first Academy Award nomination and validation of the fight camp way of life. Smith Family Trivia The Ali nomination would be yet another award ceremony that I would miss. Willow was one year old and was at home with Gammy and had to be rushed to the hospital with a 103 degree fever. She had an ear infection. Jada and I sprinted from the Oscars six minutes before the announcement of Best Actor. As we drove away, I saw Denzel with my award on the Jumbotron. For the next ten years, Darrell never left my side. He pushed me, motivated me, and defended my psychological space for the whole of my cinematic heyday. And he would check anybody. During this run, my team was on fire. Nobody moved how we moved. People in Hollywood were trying to figure out how we managed to be so productive and so successful so consistently. My core group, Harry, JL, Charlie, Omar, Durrell, my chief of staff, Jaina Babatoon Bay, my nephews, Kyle and Dion, my brother-in-law, Khalib Pinkett, family manager, Miguel Melendez, my executive assistant, Danielle Demarella. Everybody embraced the philosophy of the fight camp. We were building our lives. We were striving for perfection. We demanded excellence from each other and everybody around us. And like the junior black mafia, you could either get down or lay down. From corporate relationships to extended family and friends, Mia Pitts, property manager, Fawn Bordley, creative director, Judy Murdoch, makeup artist, Pierce Austin, hairstylist, Robert Maida, wardrobe, and all the way to the guys who detailed the cars. Everyone had to strive and climb or they couldn't be here. I am a dreamer and a builder. I picture grand visions and then I build the systems to make them real in the world. That is my love language. I want to help the people I love build extraordinary lives for themselves, but it demands that they be willing to grind and sacrifice and, most importantly, they have to trust me. And if they don't, it registers as a complete rejection of my love. The team started referring to themselves as the lifers. They were ride or die. It's impossible to build something that is of a higher quality than the quality of the people around you. There's a strange and perturbing success paradox. When you have nothing, you suffer the fear and pain of grinding to achieve your goals. But when you have everything, you suffer the brutal recurring nightmare of losing it all. I had the wife, I had the family, I had the property with the name, I was the biggest movie star in the world, but I started to notice the subtle sickness, a sort of sneaky poverty mentality. I was more anxious and fearful than ever. It all seemed so fragile. One injury, one scandal, or one flop movie away from having to move back to Philly. What if the financial crash of 1929 happened again? There is only one fear worse than the fear of not attaining the object of your desire. And that's the fear of losing it. And opening weekends are the worst of all. Pure hell. 
It's like a presidential election night. Everybody's scrambling around, trying to cross-reference the 6 p.m. numbers out of Miami with the 7.45 numbers out of Pittsburgh. These coast numbers come in first. Then you hold your breath for Chicago, then Houston, and no matter how good the polls looked or how confident you are, deep down inside, you know anything can happen. A snowstorm in the Midwest on a Thursday night shuts down hundreds of theaters, killing 12% of your opening weekend box office. And depending on the genre, Siskel and Ebert trash your movie, another 6% gone. The axiom used to be, opening weekend is about the movie star, final gross is about the movie. So while there are plenty of other factors involved, and many people are going to get fired if the movie doesn't open, the face on the poster takes the biggest hit. It doesn't matter how big your previous movie was, if this one doesn't open bigger, that means you're over. That means moving trucks outside her lake and all the incoming boxes are labeled Robert Downey Jr. When I was about nine years old, Daddy-O took me on a job with him into the basement of 48th and Brown Shop and Bag Supermarket. I'm sure most of you have never been into the basement of a supermarket. I'm not sure I can quite communicate what it's like down there, but let me give it a shot. Imagine an old, creaky wooden staircase. One or two steps are always missing. Daddy-O points them out, but to my young mind, these bottomless gaps are not just a tripping hazard, they are gateways to hell. The stairs lead down to a very poorly lit dungeon where out of date food goes to die. I'm in charge of the flashlight. We need it because the string of single light bulbs is erratic and flickering ominously. This is the stuff that horror movies are made of, and both Daddio and I are black so one of us is definitely not coming out alive. Our shoes squeak and squelch as every step sticks to the gunk-caked floor. Decades of broken bottles of ketchup, leaked canned goods, rotted bags of long-since thawed peas, a repository for the unsaleable. These cellars are generally poorly ventilated and oppressively hot. The smell gets into your clothes and your hair, but Daddy-O likes it. To him, that's the aroma of hard work. That's how you <coughs> smell when you are doing what has to be done to feed your family. Two lines of compressors, the engines that power the refrigerator and freezer cases upstairs, run down either side of this basement abyss. I point the flashlight to the barely visible, dust-covered numbers above the compressors. There it is, number 19, daddy -o says. There are decon trays everywhere. Decon is a powerful rat poison. Rodents eat it, and it essentially burns away the interior of their stomachs and intestinal tracts, leaving a pretty disgusting, disemboweled carcass. And directly under compressor number 19 was the top half of a rat that had clearly overindulged on decon. Without a single moment of hesitation, Daddy-O bent down, grabbed the dead rat with his bare hand, and tossed it aside. Two slaps of his hand on the side of his jeans, presumably to fully disinfect it, then he lay down, placing his head into the exact spot where the half a rat had spent the last month of its life. Choking my lunch back down, I distinctly remember understanding that this act was for me, for my brothers and sisters, for my family. But I also distinctly remember thinking that if the roles were reversed, my kids would not have eaten that night. I believe that the stress and uncertainty of Daddio's lifelong financial struggle was a major part of what kept him from being able to emotionally sustain a family. After you've just discarded a dead rat with your bare hand and laid your head down in the same space, you're not trying to hear <coughs> from nobody about how hard their day was. Witnessing my parents' struggles branded me with the impression that financial stability was an imperative for love and family to have any chance whatsoever to thrive. 
I was on a tear. The biggest winning streak in Hollywood history. I was working 70 to 80 hours a week. Holidays, weekends, even vacations became a time to advance. I noticed that most people came back from Christmas vacation heavier and out of shape. So the holidays, for me, became an opportunity to extend my lead. I made it a point to come back every new year in better shape than I left the last. I would work out and sometimes even abstain from Christmas dinner as act of personal discipline. Darrell loved and praised my austerity. If you not eaten, then I'm not eaten, he would say. I would spend the days studying and writing, reading a book, or rewriting a script, touching in and out of whatever holiday festivities others were enjoying. I decided to throw lavish Christmas and New Year's parties. It was a win-win-win. Jada and the kids would have all of their friends and cousins and family in town for a week of mountain fun. I would lure my business associates to beautiful ski destinations that I paid for. That meant they had an all-expense paid trip for themselves and their families. And I got to have my whole team in a remote location, a captive audience for daily strategy meetings that helped me get a jump on the year and on my competition. I was killing it. I was winning at everything. And winning, to me, meant everything else in my life should be perfect and everyone around me should be happy. But it wasn't. And they weren't. Throughout our relationship, mornings had been Jada and me bonding, building, and connecting time. We would wake up before sunrise and talk for hours. We would share the dreams we'd had during the night, revelations, new ideas. We'd discuss the kids and any issues in our family. But these days, I could tell something was shifting. Jada was having almost daily crying spells. Now, in our mornings, she would wake up sobbing. During one stretch, she cried for 45 days straight. So, Will, to what do you attribute your meteoric success? Well, I consider myself to be fairly average in talent. Where I believe I excel is in my unflinching, unyielding discipline and work ethic. While the other guy is eating, I'm working. While the other guy is sleeping, I'm working. While the other guy is making love, well, I'm making love too, but I'm working really hard at it. Reporters used to love that response, and while I was joking, the reality of the math was very simple to me. If I could wake up and start an hour earlier than everyone else, and stay an hour later than everyone else, and work through my lunch break, I would be gaining 15 extra hours every week on the competition. That works out to 780 more productive hours in a year than the next guy. That's the equivalent of one month. If you give me a one month head start on anybody, they'll never catch me. And if they need their weekends and vacations so they can get their beauty rest and recover and maintain their little punk work-life balance, then they will always be looking at my tail lights. It was Christmas Eve. We had rented a house in Aspen, Colorado. The two weeks either side of Christmas were Jada's entire reason for enduring the rest of the year. She had two non-negotiable demands. The whole family had to be there for the whole two weeks and it must be spent where there was snow. We would move around year to year, depending on the probability of frozen precipitation. There was no holiday, no celebration, no gathering or event that got anywhere near the emotional value Jada placed on family time at Christmas. Her Christmases as a child had been less than festive, to say the least, and she was going to make up for it with her own family. Note. Sherry had spent every Christmas with us for almost two decades. Quincy was right. Everyone had to wear the Christmas clothes that Jada picked out. One-piece pajamas with footies, 
ugly sweaters, reindeer ears, special one-horse open sleigh rides, singing Christmas carols, all mandatory. Black Santa Claus lamps in every bedroom, motion-activated Rudolph scaring the <coughs> out of you when you just want a Christmas cookie in the middle of the night, and a 40-foot Christmas tree wedged in the corner of our living room looking like Shaq in a Prius. During the years, Jada was peaches from a low-down dirty shame, a ghetto superstar. But at the first jingle of sleigh bells, she turned into a Midwestern middle-aged white lady. This year, Jada decided that we were going to enjoy a family game of Monopoly. Just for a little context, I am a master Monopoly player. I'm not saying it to be facetious, this is not hyperbole. I have studied, I have worked with professional instructors, I fully intended to play international Monopoly tournaments. When the dice hit, I don't have to count squares. I know that States is six squares to New York. I just pick the piece up and move it. I also know that if you land on go when you have a lot of property, you don't want to roll a seven because you'll hit chance, and you always know the property assessment card is coming, and you hate that nine from Kentucky because it throws you back to jail and you have to walk the gauntlet again without collecting your two hundred dollars. We all sat down and the game began. I found myself in the unenviable monopoly position of being stuck with Boardwalk and Park Place. Amateurs think that Boardwalk and Park Place are prime real estate. What they don't realize is that they are actually priced out of the range of manageability. The property values increase as you move around the board from Go. Boardwalk and Park Place are the most expensive to buy and the most expensive to build. And, because there's only two of them, you lose a 40% probability of getting hit as other players move around the board. You invest all of this money, they take longer to build, so you're hitting other players' properties before yours are set up to be hit, and then people skate past them for the whole of the game. In a nutshell, Boardwalk and Park Place are sucker properties. They force you into a Hail Mary toward the end of the game, praying for a big hit. In this lamentable Monopoly purgatory is where I found myself this night. Willow was seven. She established the first Monopoly. Illinois, the red properties. I have Virginia and States, the purples. Boardwalk and Park Place, and three of the railroads. But I'm broke. Jaden is leery of my Monopoly skill set, so he's squeamish about doing deals with me. He's nine, and he's refusing every angle and offer I present him with to get St. Charles from him and complete my purple Monopoly. Jada has the Pacific Line, that's the Greens, but she doesn't have any cash to build either, so she's no threat. Trey has Baltic and Mediterranean, that's the plum color right next to Go and the full Connecticut line, the Baby Blues. He has an entire block. He burned most of his cash to get it, but he's the gorilla on the board. Note, having an entire block or corner is the holy grail of Monopoly. You get hit every single time around the board and by every player. As the houses and hotels begin to come up on the board, the frailty of my boardwalk and park place position is being exposed. The competitive noose is tightening around my neck. The Hail Mary is now or never. Jada lands on Pacific. Yes! I scream, clapping my hands, causing the motion-activated Rudolph to slowly turn and see what the noise was. Pacific is Jada's property, so no one can understand why that was such an exciting moment for me. To the untrained eye, she just landed on her own property. But they are novices, and I am a master. I think I may have also startled Jada with my elation. Why was that so exciting to you, she said. Well, you just landed on Pacific, I said joyfully. I was excited to explain my logic and usher them into my elevated sphere of monopoly understanding. Pacific is six spaces from Park Place and eight from Boardwalk. 
other than 7, 6, and 8 are statistically the most common numbers rolled on a pair of dice. 6 has 6 potential possibilities. 5, 1, 4, 2, 3, 3, 3, 3, 2, 4, and 1, 5. As does 8. 6, 2, 5, 3, 4, 4, 4, 4, 3, 5, and 2, 6. When you pick those dice up next time, there's a 13.89% probability that you'll throw a 6, same percentage for 8, which comes out to nearly 30% probability that when you throw those dice, you're going to get a 6 or an 8. And when you do, I'm going to have three houses on each, and you, young lady, are toast. You can't afford the hit. I busily set to mortgaging all of my other properties, $100 each for the railroads, $70 for states, $80 for Virginia, just enough to go from two houses to three on Boardwalk and Park Place, which in Monopoly is the exponential increase. When you go from two to three, you maximize the return on investment. Are you sure you want to do that? Jada asks calmly. Hell yeah, I say, my eyes widening with anticipation. I hand Jaden, who is the banker, the $400 necessary to complete my Hail Mary transaction. You are definitely rolling a 6 or an 8. Jada remains steady, not breaking her gaze upon me. So, you are sure that you want to put your wife out of the family Monopoly game with your children on Christmas Eve? I finally turn and catch eyes with her. I was totally certain I wanted to do that before she put the emphasis on those keywords. Wife, family, children, and Christmas Eve. But now, I was down to mostly certain. If you can't stand the Monopoly heat, you gotta stay out of the Monopoly kitchen, Jada, I said jokingly. Jada nods her head, slowly palming the dice, shakes them way too many times, clearly trying to give me a chance to change my mind, but I am dug in. She drops the dice into the center of the board. The mystical 13.89% probability becomes a 100% stone-cold actuality. 4-2. Jada turns her property into the banker, Jaden, kisses Willow, touches Trey's hair, and heads off to bed. Yes, dear reader, it's obvious today, but I was functioning at the time on a very different operating system. My mindset was, you fight how you train. I felt like Jada and my family needed me to think like that. They needed me to cultivate and maintain a winner's mind. They needed me to never detrain my warrior instincts. I am a black man in Hollywood. In order to sustain my position, I can't get caught slipping, not even once. I had to be perfect at all times. It took me years to realize that Jada wasn't actually playing Monopoly. She was bonding and connecting and enjoying family time. Apparently, I was the only person who was actually PLAYING Monopoly. I have since upgraded my software and developed a new axiom. Never get caught playing Monopoly. daddy -o taught me how to play chess when I was seven years old. In the summers, we would play almost every night. He would set the board up on the back porch and go back and forth between the game and the grill. He would play our next door neighbor, Mr. John, sometimes. He played me no differently. Daddy O didn't believe in taking it easy on kids. He thought that giving children false wins did a vile disservice to their growth and development, even to their ability to survive in the world. He smashed me game after game, month after month, checkmate after brutal checkmate, year after year until I was 13 years old. I will never forget that moment. He had taught me the Gyoko piano opening. I had faithfully played that opening in response for years, but on my own, 
I started practicing the Rui Lopez variation, and he was less familiar with that. The game moved calmly from the opening to the middle game. My position was strong, and Daddio knew it. No trips to the grill, no sips of his Chivas Regal. His Turretin 100 burned untouched in his ashtray. Total silence, total attention upon every move. Daddio's style was unrelenting attack. Put the pieces down their throat, ran them down their throat, he'd say, but not tonight. First, he pulled his bishop backward and then scrambled his knight back to defend his king. It was my move, and I saw it, but he didn't. I was frozen. I sat over the board, my heart pounding, minutes burning away. I couldn't bring myself to make the fatal move. Ah, oh, <coughs> Daddio says. He saw it. Daddio looks directly into my eyes. He knows my hesitancy is not because I don't see it. He knows it's because I'm scared to make it. Go ahead. Move it, he said. I picked up my knight, setting it gingerly into its final position. The felt on the bottom of the chess piece like a soft guillotine. What's that? he said. I couldn't even bring myself to say the final words. Uh, check, I said. You know god dang well that ain't no check. What is that? Checkmate? Why you putting a question on it? Say it! Checkmate. Yep, good game. Daddy-o shook my hand, grabbed his cigarette and his drink, and went inside. We never played chess again. For years I thought it was because he was a sore loser. But as I got to understand him better, I saw that he wanted my final memory of playing chess with my father to be perfect. He wanted my mind to be programmed to winning and to savor victory. His training of me on the chessboard was complete. It was a mythological rite of passage, and he didn't want to tarnish it. Nothing in our world is mine, Jada said. I didn't want to live like this. I wanted a small farm and a quiet life. I get that, I said, but we're here, so how do we fix it? You can do anything, babe, so what do you want to do? Jada had loved metal music all through her teenage years. She has one of the most eclectic ears I've ever known. She's always dreamed of having a band, but she caught me off guard when she announced she was putting together a heavy metal band. Jada is a brilliant poet and thinker. The depth of her lyrics has always captivated and moved me. I was trying to love and support her, so I was quietly going along with her journey, and then she handed me a book called Women Who Run With The Wolves by Clarissa Pinkola Estes. Jada had marked a story titled La Loba, The Wolf Woman. The sole work of La Loba is the collecting of bones. She collects and preserves especially that which is in danger of being lost to the world. When she has assembled an entire skeleton, she raises her arms over it and sings out so deeply that the floor of the desert shakes, and as she sings, the wolf opens its eyes, leaps up, and runs away. The wolf is suddenly transformed into a laughing woman who runs free toward the horizon. A dismantled skeleton that lies under the sand, it is our work to recover the parts, to look for the indestructible life force, the bones. It is a miracle story, a resurrection story. If we will sing the song, we can call up the psychic remains of the wild soul and sing her into vital shape again. To breathe soul over the thing that is ailing or in need of restoration by descending into the deepest mood of great love and feeling, then to speak one's soul. This is singing over the bones. We cannot make the mistake of attempting to elicit this great feeling of love from a lover. 
For this woman's labor of finding and singing the creative hymn is a solitary work, a work carried out in the desert of the Psyche. The idea that La Loba had to sing over the bones to resurrect the dead parts of herself was intensely resonant to me. If you kill one aspect of a woman, you kill the whole woman. La Loba gathers the dismantled skeleton of the shattered feminine and begins to sing it back to life. Jada had killed parts of herself to sustain our family, and her band, Wicked Wisdom, was how Jada would unleash La Loba to resurrect the whole of herself. But I was not ready for Ozfest. I can do that, Daddy. Jaden used to lay in bed with me when I would read screenplays, deciding which new world I would inhabit next. He loved to hear the stories as much as I loved to tell them to him. He'd stare and watch me as my mind danced, trying the characters on for size. You can do what, man? I said. I heard you on the phone with the man earlier. The man was Gabrielle Muccino an Italian director who had just been hired to make The Pursuit of Happiness. Gabrielle didn't speak English. We needed a translator for our initial meeting. The leading directors in Hollywood were being considered for this film, but Gabrielle was the top choice. Todd Black, a major Hollywood producer, had sent JL a 2020 piece about a guy named Chris Gardner. Chris had gone from homeless and living with his young son on the streets of San Francisco to becoming a successful stockbroker. The screenplay was stunning. It was a perfect hero's journey. We had our choice of the top of the top of directors, but I loved Lutimo Basio by a director named Gabriel Muccino, so I asked JL to set up a meeting. I was pretty sure that he wouldn't ultimately direct the film, but I had long ago learned the power and importance of exploration. General meetings with world-class artists had become standard operating procedure. The meeting was awful. Gabriel didn't want to use the translator. He was trying to speak English, but he didn't speak English. JL and I didn't even try to speak Italian, because we don't speak Italian. But Gabriele's artistic passion culminated in two game-changing moves. One, he gave us an Italian film, Vittorio De Sica's Bicycle Thieves, which won the Academy Award for Most Outstanding Foreign Language Film in 1950, and through the translator said, This is the movie I want to make. And then, he got me. If you don't choose me to direct this film, Please don't choose an American filmmaker, because Americans don't understand the beauty of the American dream. Gabrielle was in. So what makes you think you can do this, man? I said to Jaden. Jaden was six years old at the time, and other than elaborate home movies, he'd never shown any interest in the business. The man keeps saying to you that he can't find a little boy to play your son. That's because I'm your son, Daddy. Well, that's true, man, I said laughing. But this would be acting. Pretending. Pretending to be your son, though, Daddy. Duh. I be your son every day. Gabrielle Muccino had been struggling to cast the perfect actor to play my son. He had seen nearly 500 kids. Gabrielle is an instinctual, intuitive artist. Things have to feel right for him. Jada and I decided that we would let Jaden audition. Grazie, 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 Gabrielle exclaimed. I wanted Jaden for this role from the first moment I met him, but the studio forbade me from asking you. What? Why? The studio felt like it was the death sentence for the film from a marketing standpoint. They felt that people wouldn't be able to suspend the disbelief seeing a Jaden and you on camera as a father and son. The studio also felt that it would seem like nepotism and just put us in the hole from the first announcement. 
At Gabrielle's pleading, they agree to allow him to put Jaden and me on camera as a chemistry test. It was such a touchy subject at the studio that Jada and I removed ourselves from the decision-making process. We allowed Gabrielle to run with his vision and cast whoever he wanted. Because we were producers, and I was starring, there were conflicts of interest everywhere we looked. So Jada and I agreed that we would not speak on the subject. We would be parents only. Jaden ultimately was asked to audition an unprecedented nine separate times. The studio simply didn't want the problems that came along with casting him. But audition after audition, in all of his innocent six-year-old glory, he proved himself the right actor for the role. After his ninth audition, though, the studio requested a tenth. Jada had had enough. She informed Gabrielle and the studio that Jaden was no longer available for the role. At which point, Gabrielle, the bleeding, passionate artist that he is, decided that he was emotionally incapable of making the film without Jaden. The studio relented and offered Jaden the role of Christopher Jr. in The Pursuit of Happiness. For me, this was perfection. On the set, at work with my son. That was how I wanted to parent, on the battlefield of life, real stakes, real outcomes, real hunting. I could correct errors in real time, and I could teach in real life scenarios. That is how I define parental love. OzFest is a traveling heavy metal festival. Established by Ozzy Osbourne and his wife Sharon, it began in 1996 and featured all the metals. Thrash, Industrial, Hardcore Punk, Deathcore, Metalcore, Post-Hardcore, Alternative, Death, Gothic, and New. Sharon had seen Jada's band and some part of her understood. She and Jada became friends and Sharon put Wicked Wisdom on OzFest in summer 2005. OzFest is the least African-American event outside of that broom and big <coughs> hockey puck thing they do at the Winter Olympics. Babe, are you sure you don't want to do some R&B? I asked softly, but I meant it hard. This is the music I feel, Jada said softly, but she meant it hard. So we packed up our children and headed down the black brick road to the land of Oz. I had never seen this side of Jada. La Loba was raging. Ozfest is a purist audience, and what began as skepticism and dismissal, with every show it was transformed first into silence and ultimately into respect. Jada's creative energies were being revived. She was coming up with ideas for TV shows and movies she wanted to write and direct. She was filling journals with poetry and artwork. It was breathtaking to see the bones struggling to reanimate. With every spit, curse, and growl, Jada seemed to come alive. Jada and I had agreed early in our marriage that we would never work at the same time. One of us would always have to be available full-time to the children. The pursuit of happiness was slated to begin principal photography in fall 2005. Jada's appearance at OzFest was so successful that Guns N' Roses asked her to open for them on their upcoming tour. But the tour was set smack dab dead center in the middle of pursuit. At the time, I felt like Jada had options. We had Mom, Mom, and Gammy, and I was going to be there every step of the way. Jaden and I would be sharing a trailer. All his scenes were with me. In retrospect, I can see the truth. Jada was faced with a horrific reality, and there was no version of her leaving her six-year-old son without his mother on his first movie gig. Jada turned down Guns N' Roses. The Pursuit of Happiness came out in 2006 and was a critical success and box office smash. 
and garnered my second Academy Award nomination. If I felt invincible before, now I really felt it. I just made a movie about a homeless black guy who gets a job in the 80s and still crushed every other movie at the box office that season. I couldn't miss. The streak continued. I Am Legend roared out the first weekend with the largest ever box office gross for a movie in December. It was a movie that featured me, on screen alone, with a dog, and it grossed around $600 million. Then Hancock, written by Vince Gilligan of Breaking Bad fame, about an alcoholic superhero, came out and grossed another $600 million plus within six months of I Am Legend. I was unstoppable. It was the greatest streak of smash hits of any movie actor in Hollywood history. I became the highest grossing film actor ever, and I still wasn't even 40 years old. The problem was, I'd conflated being successful with being loved and being happy. These are three separate things. And since I'd conflated them, I ended up suffering from an even more insidious version of the subtle sickness which I can best describe as more, 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 more. If I am more successful, I'll be happier, and people will love me more. I was trying to fill an internal emotional hole with external material achievements. Ultimately, this kind of obsession is insatiable. The more you get, the more you want, all the time never quite scratching the itch, you end up with a mind consumed by what it doesn't have and what it didn't get, and in a spiraling inability to enjoy what it has. I Am Legend had opened to the biggest December opening ever. When JL called to give me the weekend grosses, he was uncharacteristically ecstatic. The three day was 77,211,000. 321 dollars in 3600 theaters that's over 21 thousand dollars per venue nobody's ever done that ever i was quiet for a moment and then i recognized a subtle dissatisfaction why do you think we missed 80 i asked what jl said i'm saying do you think it was the ending I feel like if we had made the adjustment to the final moment, you know, if we could have made it feel more like Gladiator at the end. Are you serious right now? JL said. It's the biggest opening ever. Ever! I get that, Jay. I'm just asking you a question, I said. This is the only time that James Lasseter has ever hung up on me. Ever. I am sitting with Wayne Gretzky and Joe Montana. Their sons, Trevor and Nick, respectively, are on the field with Trey. And over the loudspeaker, the game announcer shouts, Montana deep to Smith, touchdown! Trey is a wide receiver on the number one high school football team in Southern California, Oaks Christian and the son of football legend Joe Montana just threw a touchdown pass to my firstborn. If my life were a movie, I would have looked directly into the camera, broken the fourth wall, and said, Who wrote this bull? <laughs> so let me get this straight. You want us to believe that my character grew up bagging ice in West Philly, wins the first Grammy ever given to a rapper, becomes a TV star, then the biggest movie star in the world, breaking box office records every time he releases a dang movie, marries a beautiful actress, artist, performer, and poet, has three spectacular children, and the greatest hockey player in the history of the sport, Wayne Gretzky, just patted him on the back because his son just caught a touchdown pass from the son of the greatest quarterback in the history of that sport, Joe Montana? That's unrealistic. I'm not filming a word of that bull. Get me Aaron Sorkin on the phone. 
we gotta rewrite this crap immediately. And somebody see if Robert Downey Jr. is available. I'm not sure if it's because of my lack of athletic fulfillment in my youth, or the magical energy is of the Friday night lights, or the surprising development of Trey's physical abilities and talents, but there was nothing in life that I enjoyed more than watching that kid play football. Trey was being courted by the top college scouts. Wayne and Joe were guiding me through the process. As our children were getting older, it seemed like Jada and I used to play a man-to-man -man defense, but now we were having to switch to a zone. Every kid had something important happening all the time. Just as Trey was preparing for his senior year football season, Jaden was approved by the studio to star in The Karate Kid with Jackie Chan. The family was ecstatic. Then we realized, shooting would mean three months in Beijing. Trey's games were in Southern California. We all agreed that this was an opportunity that Jaden couldn't pass up. We as a family would support him. But the previous year, every family member had been at every single one of Trey's games, and the thought of Trey playing without his family in the stands was unacceptable. During this time, it was becoming clear that the likelihood of Wicked Wisdom returning to the stage was dwindling with every moment of Smith family perfection. But in my mind, there was still a solution for every problem. We would have to grind, we would have to sacrifice, we would all have to suffer a little bit, but I had the vision, and if everybody followed my lead, we would continue to win, and we would all be happy. We were even winning in the stands. I had Jada to my right, and Sherry to my left. We were the picture of the perfect blended family. Nobody could do what we were doing, not even us. My way of problem solving was to prioritize. I would decide which problems on the list were most pressing and focus on those. But what I missed was that everybody's list was different. Jada, Willow, Jaden, and I left for Beijing in June 2009. Trey went back to school that September. All ten of Trey's football games would fall during principal photography of The Karate Kid. And then the grace of God revealed itself in the form of the International Dateline. Beijing to Los Angeles is a 12-hour flight. A 10 p.m. flight out of Beijing on Friday crossed the Dateline, landing in Los Angeles at 10 Friday morning, just in time to get to the house, get some rest, and make it to Trey's game at 6 Friday night. A 4 p.m. flight on Saturday going the other way arrives at 4 a.m. Monday morning just in time to get back to work. Jaden and I commuted 10 straight weeks, Beijing to Los Angeles and back, never missing a single one of Trey's games. I was loving life. I felt like a master. Oprah Winfrey asked us to come on her show. Me, Jada, Trey, Jaden, and Willow, even Sherry and her husband, Terrell. An entire episode dedicated to the Smith family perfection. Trademark. I was the biggest movie star in the world. Karate Kid, Jaden's first feature with him as the star, was about to be the number one movie in the world. The first season of Jada's new show, Hawthorne, had premiered with her as the leading role. Willow had just signed to Rock Nation to record her first album, Trey was the star of his high school football team, and to top it all off, here was my ex-wife talking about how much her and Jada collaborate to raise the kids. I finally had it, my own version of Dallas. The picture was complete, and it was perfect, I had built a family empire. This was beyond anything I'd ever dreamed. I feel like J.R. Ewing, I said to Jada jokingly. She said, you know J.R. got shot, right? 